Chapter 7. Brown Bess. We obtained Miss Tudum. Big dogs from the snakes and black guns from the British. A man on horseback armed with a musket caused wonderful consternation among the Shoshone tribes. Sakamapi, young man, Blackfoot, medicine man. By 1775, the estimated population of the American colonies stood at 2.8 million. Five years later, a smallpox epidemic, which lasted for two plague-ridden years, ravaged western America from Texas to Yukon, and the dwindling Indian population was further reduced. The Shoshone were not spared. Death among his troops was one of the contributing factors in Painted Man's decision to call a halt to Spanish hostilities and smallpox would pave the way for the first invasion of Oyer Ungun. In the late summer of 1785, while their hunting parties prowled the Dakota Plains in pursuit of buffalo, Big Nose was killed during a raid against the Sioux. In the ensuing days of Owitz, the man, the man with the twisted left hand, a battle-scarred Lohim warrior seized the reins of command of the powerful snake tribes, and with Painted Man on the verge of joining the Spaniards, it made him the unspoken leader of the Shoshone Nation. Twisted Hand, Owitz, is referred to by some historians, such as Judge, in his half-alligator, half-horse, as Bad Left Hand. Some forty years later, French-Canadian trappers would call him Mauvas Gouache, which literally meant Bad Left Hand. The head chief's concerns were now centered on change, within their own political structure and that of neighboring nations, for they were wise enough to realize that aspiring leaders, both domestic and foreign, could have far-reaching ramifications. In the southern Ukchoko, a snake teenager was being hailed as a youth touched by God, taking the name of Wunamaka, the, the giver of spiritual gifts. He was gathering a huge following in the snake, Ute and Paiute tribes. Many believed him to be a prophet of such magnitude as to challenge the power of the formidable Dakota medicine chief, Wabasha, the glowing man, who held the Sioux nation in the palm of his hand. He was the man the Shoshone believed to be responsible for the death of Big Nose. There is an interesting story connected with Wanamaka's name. Northwest Company journals state that in 1807, British traders in Columbia country were met by several natives. At the time, their leader was wearing only one moccasin, presumably too destitute to own another. The Norwesters thought this quite humorous. Thereafter, when referring to the Indian, they called him one mucca, mucca being French for moccasin. This nickname evolved from one mucca into Winnemucca and the name with which he entered American history. Family members such as his granddaughter, Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins, say that Winnemucca is a Shoshone word meaning giver of spiritual gifts or the gift giver, and that was his name long before contact with the Canadians. One moccasin of snake per parentage married into a Paiute clan, and thus became identified in later years as a Paiute. On the north, internal strife was ripping the Nez Perce apart. One segment under the leadership of Watiste Mene, Eat No Meat, formed their own nation soon to be recognized as the Cayuse. In this same sector, the snakes had broken off all trade relations with Sticky Mouth, Pakia Kwaye chief of the Blackfeet, so they could expect to be carrying on warfare in that direction. On the west, a moody youth called Konkomli was in line to inherit the throne of the Chinook nation. The Chinook posed no real threat, but a change of command could liven up the slave trade, which would add little to the comfort of their horseless wards, the Paiutes. Meanwhile, some 3,000 miles to the northeast, the British, who had been momentarily detained from their plans to annihilate the snakes, were taking a hard look at the distant Pacific Slope. Thirty-two years had elapsed since Hudson's Bays had dispatched Anthony Henday into the interior to negotiate trade agreements with the Blackfeet, and still they were not re reaping any furs from the Oregon country. Obviously, it was only a matter of time before the Americans started casting yearning eyes in that direction, 
and to add to their concerns, a stubborn group of independent Canadian traders were challenging company authority in central Canada and in the process driving up the cost of furs to Hudson Bay's traders. Company agents who had been working in the inland tribes consistently painted a gloomy picture. West of the Rockies, in the unexplored Columbia drainage, there existed a dangerous Indian nation, a people so hostile that they would be extremely detrimental to British expansion in that remote region. From what information they could gather, the snakes were different from other inland tribes, in appearance, in wealth, and in their excessively warlike nature. None of the tribes contacted had seen the interior of the snake's hunting grounds, believed to be centered around a mountain range deep in the heart of Oregon country. All agreed, to, all agreed the snakes were a predatory group who preyed upon all other tribes. In fact, according to informants, these people were so antagonistic they would attack their own members just as viciously over real or imagined wrongs as they would an unrelated tribe. And thus, as the Honorable Caleb Cushing observed in a speech to the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs, occasionally an obstacle presents itself in some unproductive country or some Indian tribe, and the advancing column is momentarily checked. Faced with this intelligence, British officials, including the sovereign head of England, deemed it prudent for the adventures of the Hudson Bay Company to bring the snakes into submission quickly and by the simple expedient of arming the Blackfeet with muskets and plying them with liquor to bolster their courage. Thus encouraged, let the Blackfeet deplete the population of malcontents while the British reaped the rewards. In this manner, Bay Company officials were now to prove that the American states had always suspected that being that Hudson's Bay represented one of the more corrupt monopolies instituted during the reign of Charles II. They stated, as stated in the House of Representatives Report Number 101, 25th Congress, 3rd Session, January 4, 1839. Before the winter's blast of 1786 could choke off the St. Lawrence Seaway, a shipment of whiskey, arms, powder, and ball was dispatched with the Grand Brigade into the Canadian Rockies. The liquor was rock gut, but the armament was definitely not of the quality of the Carolina muskets as Hudson's Bay called the ordinary trade weapon. This same weapon was referred to by Americans as the London Fusil, the Shoshone considered it safe to fire only if you were an expert horseman and you could, while galloping hellbent, hand pour powder into the barrel, disgorge from your mouth a bullet into that barrel, and strike the butt smartly to place the bullet. Tip the gun horizontally, take an accurate sight and fire, and do all this in that critical split second before the ball shifted forward. The dog soldiers knew from experience that if you made a mistake, a split or ringed barrel bloomed right in front of your face. The London Fusil was a highly inaccurate .58 caliber smooth bore, lightweight weapon running from 46 to 64 inches in length. In the 1820s and 30s, the United States government supplied them to the fur trading posts under the name of Northwest Guns. Small wonder the snakes and Comanches were unimpressed with European technology when it came to firearms. Especially was this true with Twisted Hand, who received his name from a ruptured musket barrel. Hudson's Bay was not about to supply their new allies with a weapon such as this. The corporate heads of Hudson's Bay Company meant business. The Blackfeet were given official British military muskets, fondly referred to as the Brown Bess. These guns, weighing between 10.5 and, and 12 pounds, shot a .75 caliber ball at an effective range of 100 yards, a rather sophisticated weapon for a tribe that had never before seen a firearm. By spring of 1787, company officials were patient, impatient to find out if their plan for destruction was being implemented. A British agent slipped out of St. Anne's Chapel on the southern tip of Montreal Island as a priest intoned, the Lord be with you. A bound servant to the Hudson's Bay Company, this man was departing for the unknown interior of British America. 
his mission to find his way into the Rocky Mountains, a journey that would place him some 2,300 miles closer to Oregon's country and to determine if company muskets were being put to the proper use. David Thompson, soon to be known by the Indians as Coco, sent the man who watched stars, had been chosen for his important job, not because he had studied for seven years as a geographer, but because he had an an unusually winning way with the native girls, allowing him free passage where others dared not tread. With the priestly blessing and company orders spurring him on, the 17-year-old clerk embarked up the Atawa River into the waiting forest. Far to the west, the balmy days of spring were warming the land, Deep within the misty valleys of the southern blues, the Shoshone were stirring from their winter camps in preparation for their annual trek to the east, hunting, fishing, trading, and enjoying life to the fullest. By midsummer, the various bands were separating by hundreds of miles, each in pursuit of its own desires. By late autumn, their whole way of life would be changed forever. They had no way of knowing what happened to family and friends, for where the Blackfeet struck, there were no survivors. In their drunken stupor, the Blackfeet were killing horses and dogs, oldsters and youngsters, women and babies, something which had never before happened in the annals of Indian warfare. Authors note the following two chapters are drawn almost in their entirety on information obtained in interviews with Columbia Plateau and Great Basin Indians, including Tom Ochihio and Agnes Banning Phillips, descendants of Old Deer Running, Dave Choctote, descendant of Wolf Trail, Leroy Saunders, Yakima Tribe, John Wassies, Amatilla Tribe, George Winishut, Paiute Tribe. These two chapters are based on history passed down from generation to generation. Who can say that their method of record keeping is any less accurate than the written history of the European tribes? Following the birth of the Shoshone Nation in the early 16th century, they had been fighting Spanish, French, and British for nearly 250 years before the Americans arrived on the scene in 1805 and had maintained records of these events. Anthropologists have determined that Shoshone pictographs tell a definite story of tribal events. There are caves in the Mill Creek Valley, east of Prineville, whose time-faded pictographs have defied archaeologists in their attempts to solve an age-old mystery. Some of the clearest characters are found in Medicine Cave on the old Martin Ranch. In this cave, tribal history has been recorded as late as the 1880s. Concerning the information given by Indian informants, what could be researched through Canadian and American records proved to be correct. The Lewis and Clark Journals of 1806, Northwest Company Journals of 1810, and Pacific Fur Company Journals of 1811-12 describe the same events at Kalilo Falls as those told by the Indians, which occurred by their reckoning some 20 to 25 years earlier. The event was placed at six summers before Captain Robert Gray put the USS Columbia across the river bar or as the Indians put it, a big war canoe carrying white men entered the river of the north. And approximately one year before the arms delivery up to the Blackfeet, if nothing else, the reader will gain a better insight on these people called snakes. They possessed human traits, social habits, economic needs, no different, no better, and certainly no worse than their European counterparts.